Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. This is our recorded lecture via Zoom for this is final topic actually for the syllabus of class one below one five one zero. So in the previous lecture we have covered uh, the same topic but the first three defenses. Um, so our topic is general defenses in thoughts applicable for all categories of thoughts, intentional thoughts, non-intentional thoughts. So for, for part one of the lecture uh, earlier, we have discussed about um, the first three defenses, which are so common. Uh, we started with uh, volunteer and fit injury, and then we discussed about um, illegality as well as inevitable accident. So now um, the lecture for this part yeah, will be covering okay, uh, the five, okay, the next five defenses. We'll start with uh, acts of God. And then we'll proceed with private defense. And then the second uh, part of the video, I mean, another part of the video will be covering necessity, mistake, and statutory authority. Okay, we'll start with defense uh, of acts of God. Actually, this defense is also applicable for uh, contract law, okay, law of contract, but of course, uh, with um, different authorities or case law. Now we focus on thoughts law. As far as acts of God is concerned, okay, in terms of application, it has been um, used or allowed in a very limited case, limited situations, or that means uh, it is used uh, in a very limited application. And um, nowadays, okay, it is very very uh, the cause attitude is that it is less favorable because um, uh, taking into account, okay, given the advanced level of mankind's knowledge and technology. So as compared to those days, those centuries, so um, people nowadays, okay, we are living in um, so-called advanced, which is relative. Actually, the word is so relative, but uh, as compared to uh, those years, okay, those centuries, then we are quite advanced. That's why this kind of defense, okay, as of course, is not really favorable okay, when, it, when it comes to cause uh, attitude. And then what is the requirement in order for the defendant to uh, plead this particular uh, defense? Okay? It is required that the damage, okay, the loss or injury occurs okay, through natural causes. So it must be proved that there exists natural causes and uh, these causes are unforeseeable and it happened, it occurs okay, without any human intervention. And this part of, I mean, this rule actually was um, enunciated, established in the case uh, of Tanner and Earl of Glasgow way back in 1864. And then um, if the party wants to apply this defense, they want to use this defense, then there is a test, specific test, of course, also taken from case law. So what's the test? The test is whether a foresight and rationality okay, may comprehend the possibility of the event occurring, whether it is something which is comprehensible, whether something which is foreseeable or acceptable by everyone. Okay? And another way, uh, and another part of the test is whether the event could have been reasonably anticipated or prevented. That's why if you look at the uh, today's technology, okay, most of the natural disasters, for example, catastrophe, okay, it is possible to be anticipated, okay, to be predicted at least. Okay? Like for example, we have weather forecast. Okay? And then natural danger escape through a natural cause is an act of God. Okay? And then artificial danger through a natural cause is hardly. So that even though that there is a thin line between these two, but then if it involves something which is artificial, the danger is actually created because of artificial um, situation or circumstances, then uh, this defense will fail. Okay? It won't be allowed by the court. It won't be accepted by the court. Let's have a look at the um, local case first, okay? Uh, the case is, actually the case is applicable to both tax law and contract law. So Kwan San Ming and Cha Chi reported in 1965, this is pertaining to action for damages, uh, I mean claiming for compensation for breach of contract or alternatively, so there was an alternative argument put forward by the party, okay? Alternatively, damages compensation for negligence. So um, the the, file, the suit was filed both on the grounds here, alternative ground. First under contract law, another one under uh, tax law, which is negligent. What happened actually? 
arising out of a contract to tow logs from Kampung Abai to Sandakan. So those days, I think this is um very uh, important industry, especially in uh, Sabah. So what's the defense of, uh, of the appellant? This is appeal case. Uh, the appellant was arguing that, okay, um, 253 logs, which is a big amount actually, big quantity, were lost in a storm so violent as to amount to an act of God. So he was arguing this storm actually, this is acts, acts of God defense, okay, to, uh, to absolve him from liability. And the defendant should be excused from all liability for damages. So he doesn't want, he didn't want to uh, be liable for the payment okay, of a compensation for the missing locks here. But the learned judge held that, okay, because remember the court's attitude, less favorable, okay, this uh, defense. So the judge held that, although there was a storm, yeah, they agreed there was a storm, but the court held that it was not a storm violent enough to be regarded as an, as an, as an ex of a god. So basically, it didn't satisfy the test that we had, we had discussed earlier. So he gave appellant, I mean, the judgment was, was, was given against the, uh, the, the defendant or the appellant. And then um, uh, the the then chief justice, the, the former chief justice, okay, Wiley C J. This is um, his observation, okay, which is important, relevant for our discussion. He said that an act of God in the legal sense of the term, so legally legal meaning here, legal interpretation, okay, may be defined as an extraordinary occurrence or circumstance which could not have been foreseen. So this is something which is extraordinary, okay, and then cannot be foreseen. And another one could not have been guarded against. There's nothing you can do in order to guard against it, to be ready, okay, to be prepared with it. Or in, a, in other words, more accurately, accident due to uh, natural causes directly and exclusively without human intervention. So basically, there are three parts okay, of the requirements here, even though it doesn't say requirement, but, but you can actually extract okay, the elements here. First, it has to be extraordinary cannot be foreseen and cannot be guarded against. There's nothing much you can do in order to be prepared for the um, natural occurrence. So that's the observation and finding by, by the judge in Kuan San Ming. But uh, the defense of us of, of God actually, uh, this is the landmark case, okay, common law, which uh, if you refer to any references, okay, any um, whatever you search, for example, you will come across this case whenever uh, the discussion is pertaining to acts of God. The case is Nichols and Marsland, 1876. So in this case, okay, take note of the uh, year when it happened. A heavy rainfall caused the embankments okay, of defendants' artificial lakes collapse because of the very heavy rainfall. And water from the lake swept away it's not one, two, three, four bridges belonging to plaintiff. So because of that, plaintiff was suing defender, suing defenders okay, for negligence. Okay? Uh, so the court applied as of God, the court accepted the defense because why? Okay, at those particular time, it was not reasonably foreseeable and defendant actually was not negligent. But actually this decision was later questioned. It was argued in the case of Greenock, uh, which was reported in 1970. So meaning the year Nikos and Maslin happened in 19th century. But later we have um, 20th century, early 20th century. But the court actually questioned okay, this uh, decision in Nikos and Maslin. So what happened in Greenock Corporation and Caledonian Railway? Um, it also it involved another heavy rainfall. So it caused defendants' pool to flood. And water from the pool flowed to highway and then it flowed onto plaintiff land. So from the highway to the land, okay, land belonging to the plaintiff. So it caused damage to plaintiff property. So now plaintiff was suing defendant. And defendant was using the defense of as of God, like the one established in Nichols and Marsland. But in this case, the court did not accept the acts of a court, meaning the court differed okay, from the earlier decision, and the court held that defendant was negligent. So what's the reasoning? The court held that the, the act of the defendant in collecting and damming up the water of a stream, okay, when he chose to do so, he had a duty to ensure that people of lower ground, whoever living nearby, especially lower ground, okay, would not be injured or adversely affected. 
as a consequence of their activities. So activities are very high risk. So there is a very high duty of care to ensure that um, the neighboring people, lower, especially those who live uh, at the lower ground, won't be affected in case anything were to happen to the, um, uh, the, the activities. Okay? So uh, in another words, okay, what we can learn from this case is that, is that interference okay, by collect activities, okay, human activities collect. This is not natural collecting, damming up the water of a stream, okay? So this interference, it creates a duty on the defendant and he cannot simply be absolved from the liability by arguing, oh, um, the heavy rainfall is an S of God. Because without his activities, I mean, um, the damage won't be caused, okay? Uh, or the injury won't be caused to the defendant. So the court actually distinguished from the earlier case, from Nichols and Marslin. So we are done with the case of acts of God. Actually, uh, it is very uh, unlikely okay, for the court to accept this defense, especially taking into account the, uh, uh, I mean, our situations nowadays, lah, okay, because it is all usually most of the time is possible, and then it's possible to do something about it to take all the relevant precaution. Okay. Now we move to the second uh, defense okay, for this part of the video. Um, this is a bit, it is called as private defense. Okay, take note of the word private defense. So another similar word which, which we can use interchangeably is uh, self-defense. So private defense, self-defense. So uh, what is this thing? Okay, what, what's the defense is all about? It is a very natural thing for survival and prevention of repeated strikes against him or itself. This is something which is natural reaction or we call it reflect i mean you you respond it naturally okay without thinking about it okay uh, because um people okay human being they need to survive and they prevent uh, they have to uh, pre uh, protect themselves okay from being uh, imposed with injury for example okay repeated strikes um, the, the word here so in order to apply this um private defense there are two tests Okay, very specific test. Okay, what's the test here? The first one. First, the word, the, the emphasis is on the word reasonable. So is it reasonable to apply violence in that particular situation? If the answer is yes, the next question okay, is, is the violence used proportionate to the strike? For example, if somebody is a fight, I mean, is somebody in the fight, okay, if A uh, kicks B, so proportionate act by uh, B towards A is another kick lah. He cannot use something which is uh, beyond the, uh, I mean, which is not proportionate in that particular situation. So if the answer is yes to both, then yes, private defense is applicable, is um, uh, justifiable to be um, to be applied. Okay, uh, but, uh, but, but there might be some other situation here. Okay, is it reasonable to apply violence? If it's not reasonable, then cannot use private defense. Or maybe it's yes first, and then is it proportionate? Then it's not proportionate. Then again, private defense won't be accepted by the court. So uh, the test, I mean, we call it as two tests. Yeah? Both of the tests must be uh, fulfilled, must be satisfied. It must be yes to both. Okay, the answer must be yes to both. If the answer is no to both or either one, then we cannot apply or the court won't, won't uh, accept the uh, defense of private defense lah, put forward by the defendant. Let's have a look uh, at the case law. Um, okay, now we talk about defense of person. So the issue or question to be posed all right, in that particular situation is that, is the danger imminent? Imminent is about about to happen, okay? About to kick, or about to uh, about to hit here, okay? Uh, about to punch uh, in the picture. So the case is Lane and Holloway. This is a common law uh, decision by Court of Appeal reported in 1968. So it uh, it involved a fight, okay? In a fight due to it. so it started with the words exchange, okay, between plaintiff and defendant's wife. So and um, I mean um, later, okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, from the exchange of word, then it become a fight, lah. Okay, physical fights here. So now, plaintiff hit defendant on the shoulder, but defendant retaliated, causing plaintiff to suffer injury. So it, this injury requires sixteen stitches. So it's very serious or severe injury. 
So the observation by Lord Danning, Lord Danning um, when he was giving the judgment, he said that because defendant was uh, arguing private defense, but Lord Danning said that defendant should not have taken plaintiff words as a challenge. Okay, why? Because uh, the court look at the look at the age difference as well as um, how violent. Okay, the violent uh, retaliation. So the fact that when you retaliate, okay, it causes such an injury. So this is something which is not proportionate. This is something which is not, which is not uh, reasonable, unreasonable. So the court didn't accept argument or defense of self-defense. It was not applicable. It wasn't accepted in this particular case. And this is the, um, the, the, the detail of the case, how it happened. Okay, who are the, the parties here? So the claimant actually, um, he was a retired gardener. So usually the age is 50s lah, or maybe 60s, okay, retired gardener. So he was injured by the defendant in the fight. So who was defendant? Defendant was, um, the, the age was 23. So you can imagine, okay, um, the, the, the gap of the age here. Okay? And defendant was the owner of a cafe, um, which was located nearby, okay, close to where the claimant lived. And the cafe, the cafe was frequented by youth late at night. And Clement was not happy okay, with the existence of the cafe and it create noise. Like usually okay, with the uh, youth, um, I mean, presence here. So the Clement objected to the behavior of the youth and the relations between the two neighbors were straight. They are not on good terms, basically. So that's why okay, the Clement couldn't take it anymore. So one night, the Clement shouted abuse, like all the um, vulgar words perhaps okay and the defendant's wife from outside their house so it's not really he went and uh, punched the um, the wife straight away he just shouted okay he was not happy with what happened and then the defendant the husband lah, because the words was shouted to the wife defendant age 23 remember very young so he was in bed at the time was about to sleep perhaps okay so he got up and went outside in his nightgown like the picture i believe okay so the claimant thinking that he was about to be hit because he was remember he was the one who shouted the words so he thought defendant wanted to um uh, hit him okay so he started with the punch lah okay after um i mean uttering all the words and then he punched the defendant the husband Defendant, okay, he's a young, he was a young man, so he he struck the claimant in the eye. So he retaliated, he punched him back in the eye. Okay. So as a result of the punch, claimant received 18 stitches. I'm sure 18 or 16, okay, between that, and required surgery. So now claimant, uh, the retired gardener, uh, he brought an action for damages. And one of the defenses put forward by the defendant is that private defense. Okay, but the court didn't accept because it wasn't proportionate, it wasn't reasonable in that particular situation it's possible to uh, hit back but then not to cause such a serious injury take note of the age gap as well okay just now defense of person okay it's also possible for um, a defendant to defend his property okay we call it as defense of property the case is homes and beige okay uh, 1853, um, yeah, uh, the, the rule is that the defense of property can be raised by someone okay, who has the right of possession to the property. If you want to use the defense of property, it must be proved that um, the property belong to you. Basically, you are in the possession of the property. It cannot be anyone. Okay? You cannot say, oh, I want to protect his property. It cannot. Okay? The property has to be in your possession. It belongs to you, basically, plainly speaking. So what happened in this case, Holmes and Bashir? Bash or beige, I'm not sure. So plaintiff and defendant, they were members of a cricket club. Both were the members to the same club. And plaintiff actually was forcibly removed from cricket field by defendant's direction. So that uh, defendant was the one who instructed plaintiff to be removed, okay, from the, uh, to be chased, like chased out from the cricket club. So now, uh, uh, plaintiff was, uh, I mean, uh, claimed the uh, damages, okay, for, I mean, filing action for assault. Okay, assault will be covered later uh, in parts two. Okay, in action for of, for assault, defendant used the defense of property. Defendant said, "Oh, I remove him because I wanted to defend the property. I wanted to defend the cricket club." But the court held that the defense cannot be used because why? Defendant does not have possession of the property. Okay, you 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 don't own the cricket field. Okay, because uh, it was possessed by the committee of the club, not by the individual person. 
So in order to be successful to use this defense, okay, uh, the defendant, okay, the one who put forward the defense, who argued the defense, okay, must prove the property belonged to him or he was in possession of the property. So it wasn't fulfilled in this particular uh, case. And another case here, Craswell and Soul. Okay, you can uh, the picture relevant to the story here. Craswell and Soul, uh, reported in nineteen forty seven. Um, uh, plaintiff is uh, plaintiff owned a dog, so he's the dog owner, and defendant owned sheep. Okay, and defendant is the sheep owner. Okay, so plaintiff dog he um, the dog chased defendant sheep, so it caused the sheep to miscarry. So obviously the sheep was pregnant. Okay, bearing some child lah, basically. I mean the, the, the baby. Okay. Uh, so defendant, because of that, defendant, the ship owner shot plaintiff dog. And then when he was being sued okay, by the plaintiff, uh, he argued the defense of property. And the court held that uh, there are two tests to be fulfilled. Okay, must be proved here. First, the ship was in actual and imminent danger. I mean, was it there? Okay. And if the dog is left at large, okay, if nothing happened, if nothing, uh, no action is taken, okay, this would leave the ship in constantly imminent danger. So basically, both of the tests actually were proved by the uh, by the defendant the one who owned the ship. Okay? So the court accepted the defense. So he was absolved from liability for shooting the, the dog here. It was reasonable in that particular situation. Okay, we stop here. We are going to continue with the second part of the video uh, for the next uh, defense. Okay? Let me stop share. Okay, till then. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.